You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here as in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not uh, as simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many more doors. See, the show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data am. So the, the uh, main crux of what I would like to discuss today is, um, as I said, I want to go over a little bit this Sean Payton thing because it's pretty interesting. Um, I don't want to say uncharted territory, but certainly in recent memory. Everything's very sterile these days. I can imagine in the past there have been plenty of vicious bloodbaths between teams, owners, coaches, etc. But in recent memory, that's been um, there's been very little of that. So I've been trying to consume as much as I possibly can on what exactly is going on and get all the perspectives that are out there before I form my own opinion. The other thing is an interview with Andrew Brandt, which I found um, illuminating. And um, I think I appreciate it because essentially it's just Andrew Brandt's like, look, this is what the Packers do. And he highlights exactly what the Packers do. And he talks about when and where the Packers are within that and when and where over these past few years we've deviated from that. And again, my, my whole thought process on that is I agree with the Packers way. Everything that the Packers have done that is within the Packers way of doing things, I agree with. Everything that is outside of it, I disagree with. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, what I didn't necessarily intend to talk about was something that came up when I was trying to watch some of this Sean Payton, uh, Nathaniel Hackett, New York Jets, Broncos feud thing going on, is uh, Colin Coward and his uh, shaggy-looking buddy over here. I forget his name. They pivot to the Rodgers took a $35 million pay cut thing, which I've already talked about it. I don't necessarily intend to talk about it again. But he... Coward made the point that it seems as though Rodgers went to the Jets and said, you know, I need to change some things and he's going to change this, 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 this. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, you know what? He's right. Now, I don't necessarily think he woke up and just had like 75 different revelations at once. I think there's a very good chance that he knew the difference between right and wrong when he was in Green Bay. He knew what good leaders did compared to bad leaders do. He understands the benefit of a pay cut and the correlation between that and winning when he was in Green Bay, just like he did in, with the Jets. But the sort of slam dunk point that I would like to make is that Rodgers has essentially admitted that everything Packers fans have been saying all along has been correct. Everything about, I don't like how Rodgers acts in this regard, he should be more like this. Oh, no, 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 no. Back and forth and fighting, fighting, arguing, bickering. Rodgers has conceded all of it depending on what specifically you were nitpicking about, I don't know. But as far as broad strokes, right, showing up shouldn't be controversial, but it was. Guess what? He has gone to New York and said, no, it's probably a good idea I show up. Bonding with your teammates, even the young one. Oh, that's stupid. He shouldn't have He goes to the Jets. He thinks it's a good idea all of a sudden. Spending time in the facility working out and working on your craft as opposed to going on vacation. He feels as though suddenly that that's a good idea taking a pay cut to help your team, having a singular vision that is focused on 
winning and helping the team around you win, not just you yourself getting as much money as you can and being as great as you can, but making sure the team around you is as great as possible, seems to be his new focus. And specifically, rather than sitting around saying, yeah, you know, I'm close to retirement, I might be retiring soon, blah, blah, blah. He's not talking about that. He's talking about, you know what, let's take this one year, let's make it two years, let's go for as long as we possibly can, and let's go win as many Super Bowls as we can. Like, gee... That's a novel thought, Rogers. That's crazy. I, You know, when you were here all these years, that never crossed my mind. As far as I'm concerned, this is one big concession by Rogers. And again, I don't think he just had one massive revelation. I think it's evidence that he knew that a lot of the things he was doing was not what was best for the team, but he didn't care. It was not best for the organization. And in his mind, the organization had done wrong by him. Now, what has the Jets done right for him? Well, they haven't done anything for him. But it doesn't matter. It's not about doing right for me. It's just, how dare you have drafted my replacement? I hate you, and so I'm going to dig in my heels now. It became like, if I may use another office reference, remember Beach Day? Michael told them all to pick team names. Stanley refused to pick a team name. And so Michael's like, all right, you will be the red team. Stanley said, no, blue team. That's Aaron Rodgers. He was Stanley, and uh, Michael Scott was Brian Gutekunst. He just hated everything about him. He felt that he was running the company into the ground. He was an inept leader. He didn't want him talking to him. Get away from me. And his whole thing was, I mean, it's, it's actually a fantastic parallel when you think about Stanley. He cared about doing his job and doing his job well, but that was it. He had no interest in anybody else around him. He quickly corrected anybody that said that they were friends with him, which multiple people did. Andy said it. Um, Phyllis said it. And he corrected him. He was like, nope. Right? What did Phyllis say? Me and Stanley are close. Stanley said, we sit close. Me and you are not friends. I am not here to benefit you or anything. I'm here to do my job so I can retire and send my kid to college, and that's it. Now, Rogers is with the Jets, and he's become Dwight. Shows up early and waters the plants. He's giving Michael the chills, you know, rubbing peanut butter in his hair. There might be a gym somewhere that he hates, but, you know, overall, he cares about the company. But again, that that was my biggest takeaway when I thought about it. I was like, you know what? You're right. He has quote-unquote, realized that maybe he wasn't doing things right and should change. He didn't realize anything. He knew it all along, and as soon as he went to the Jets, he said, okay, I'm not... And honestly, I think that might be a big part with this contract. The contract is absurd. It's completely absurd. And so he kind of, in in a sense, potentially just looked at the contracts like, never mind, you you don't have to pay that. That was just a Gutekunds tax. That was I hate you tax. I'll just get rid of the I hate you tax. Let's let's just shave some of this off, split it up, and uh, now we've got a more reasonable contract to work with. We'll be good to go. You think I was going to make you pay that? That's stupid. That contract was stupid, dude. I would never make my worst enemy pay that. I'd make Satan pay it, but not my worst enemy. No. <laughs> Anyways, but let's get into this Sean Payton thing. Um, well, let's do the backstory first for those that don't know. So Sean Payton sat down and did an interview with USA Today. It was USA Today's Jarrett Bell. Here's how it starts, okay? Not one minute had passed from the moment Sean Payton welcomed a curious visitor into his office when the new Denver Broncos coach delivered a striking message. So you're, uh, what was his name? You're Jared Bell, right? The coach has agreed to do an interview. You're like, all right, cool, yeah, I, hey, I got an interview with the coach, whatever. You drive all the way out there, park your car, you go find his office, you knock, like, hey, how you doing? All right, yeah, come on in. Like, oh, yeah, coach, I appreciate you doing the, yeah, 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 yeah. You sit down. First words out of the man's mouth. Here's how it starts. Can I say this to you, Peyton said, shuffling stuff on his desk? Of course, you can let it rip. I'm going to be pissed off if this is not a playoff team. Okay, (laughs) and we're off. (laughs) It just seems to me like a guy who has a lot to get off his chest. And I think we're going to see that (laughs) as we continue. So he says, so there it is, a flag planted, blah, blah, blah. A little further down, it talks about the message that he delivered to his team. It says, quote, hey, we're going to be on time. We're going to learn how rewarding it is to play for each other, compete for each other rather than for ourselves, and I expect us to think playoffs. Now, I'm not going to say that Matt LaFleur isn't saying that. I'm sure he has a similar message, but it's nice to hear, considering I don't think that that's necessarily the orientation of our team. Hopefully that becomes the orientation of our team. Play for each other, not for yourself. And I expect you to be thinking playoffs, which again, of course everyone thinks playoffs, but there's a difference between teams that have a playoff mentality and teams that have a, you've got uh, imposter syndrome. But then it starts to get juicy from there. It says, the Broncos, who haven't had a winning campaign since 2016, surely need this culture change. The franchise, with eight Super Bowl appearances in its history and now six coaches in 10 years, became a laughingstock 
last season as it paired rookie coach Nathaniel Hackett, who lasted 15 games, with veteran quarterback Russell Wilson and produced an unmitigated disaster underscored by the NFL's worst offense. Here is what he had to say, Sean Payton, that is, the new coach of the Denver Broncos. Quote, it doesn't happen often when an NFL team or organization gets embarrassed, Payton said, and that happened here. Part of it was their own fault relative to spending so much effing time trying to win the offseason, the PR, the pomp and circumstances, marching people around and all that stuff. Any of that. The Jets did that this year. You watch. Hard knocks. All of it. I can see it coming. Remember when uh, Dan Snyder put that dream team together? I was at the Giants in 2000. I was a young coach. I thought, how are we going to compete with them? Deion Sanders is there now. That team won eight games or whatever. So listen, just put the work in. So what is he saying? What is he starting with? Part of the issue last year was it was all this big freaking PR campaign. We're going to put Russell Wilson around and we're going to do all this PR stuff. Remember all the freaking commercials and everything he was doing and all the bragging and all that stuff? It was about winning the offseason, winning the offseason. And and it's true about the the dream team stuff. I remember the dream team and I remember thinking this team is unstoppable and that's what the media said. But at the end of the day, it really does come down to a cohesive unit that can work together and does put in the work. And if that's not you and you think this is all just about we're going to win because we have these players, that isn't good enough. And I'll be honest, I love that he took a shot at the Jets. I don't know that I believe it because I I always just believe in that dream team stuff. Maybe not wholeheartedly. I don't necessarily assume that everything's just going to be perfect. It does get to be difficult to look at their defense and Rodgers and Garrett Wilson and think, I mean, it's got to at least be a playoff team, right? But it does make sense. Look at the Broncos. That was a dream team scenario. And he directly said one of the issues was all this winning the offseason stuff, all the PR, all the distractions. And then you think about it, it's like, that is literally the Jets. I mean, they were doing PR before they even had Rodgers. They were, they were coming together talking about, we got him. Remember before they even had him? And it's like, what is wrong? Why would you do that? Because ahead of the, even ahead of the negotiation and getting a good deal, it was about PR. And now they're on hard knocks. I've never really fully understood the hard knocks being a distraction thing. I'm sure to some degree it is. Can't imagine it's that massive of a one. It's just people off in the corner videotaping. But it makes me happy, man, because I need to believe somehow that that team with Aaron Rodgers and all the stuff that they have going on is going to collapse. I need to believe they're going to get a really high pick. Somehow Rodgers is going to play the whole year and they're still going to be bad. So I'm all in on that. Unfortunately, one of the worst things you could do is give them some motivation, especially by them, I mean Aaron Rodgers. And when you have already a pissed off Aaron Rodgers, and then you say, just watch, they're going to suck. <sighs> I think that's working against us. But anyways, let us continue. <laughs> it says, the hunch here could, is that Peyton could care less about making the Jets or anybody's bulletin board. Then he continues. It just keeps getting better. Man, we ran that kid through the car wash a hundred times now, Peyton said of Wilson and questions of how his uh, coach quarterback dynamic will play out. But that's the storyline, though. How is this kid going to look? How is it going to work? You know what? We're fixing to find out, as Bill would say. Think about what that means. We ran that kid through the car wash a hundred times. You ever have like a stain on a shirt and you wash it and it's a little better, but it's still there and you keep washing it and washing it and washing it? It's maybe not the best example. I could think of some others, but let's just stick with the stain one because it can get pretty dark pretty fast. <laughs> the point is, he was tainted. The, the, the visual would be like him just covered in manure for a year, and we washed him. And he came out of the shower, and he still was stinking. And we put him back in, and he was stinking. And we ran him through a hundred times. So then it continues. The question, what happened last year with Wilson? Here's what he said. Oh, man, Peyton began. There's so much dirt around that. There's 20 dirty hands for what was allowed, tolerated in the frickin' training rooms, the meeting rooms. I'm not ad-libbing. This is what he said. The offense, I don't know, Hackett. A lot of people had dirt on their hands. It wasn't just Russell. He didn't just flip. He still has it. This BS that he hit a wall, shoot, they couldn't get a play in. They were 29th in the league in pre-snap penalties on both sides of the ball. It says, Wilson, 34, is undoubtedly in better hands with Peyton and coordinator Joe Lombardi, who served for 10 years as Peyton's quarterback coach with the Saints. And it's virtually a given that he will get a boost from an over, overhauled offensive line, which includes a huge free agency investment made in right tackle Mike McGlinchey and left guard Ben Powers. Peyton is encouraged by what he saw from the offseason work with Wilson, maintaining, quote, he's still got gas in the tank. Yet another layer of the Wilson saga involved the kid glove handling he received from Hackett, which fueled much speculation and criticism as the season, which ended 5-12, and 12, spiraled out of control. I've been talking about this all offseason. 
the idea that, you know, when Hackett came in, what did he say? Whatever you want to do, man, whatever you want to run, whatever plays you like. And then, of course, he was allowed to have his own trainers, his own coaches, his own everything. It was such a BS thing. And by the way, again, I'm going to throw this back in some Packers fans' faces. A lot of Packer fans want Rodgers treated that way. Whatever he wants, he should get. He's the MVP. He should be treated like royalty around here. He shouldn't have to show up to things. If he wants to have people on site, I'm sure, I, I guarantee you, if Rodgers had come in and said, I wanted to have a trainer or something come in, he's my trainer, I know what he's all about, and Matt LaFleur said no, or Gutekunst said no, and I'm pissed, I know for a fact the same people that defend Rodgers about everything would have said he should have been allowed to have that. There's a difference in philosophy. There is the, I'm the coach, you're the player. I tell you what to do, you shut your mouth and you do it. The GM has his job, I have my job, you have your job. There are people that feel like that's how things should be. Coaches should be coaches, players should be players, and GM should be GM. And then there are some people who say, you know, Rodgers has a lot to offer. Maybe he should be a little bit the coach, a little bit the GM, a little bit this. That's what they did in Denver, and that's why it was an unmitigated freaking disaster. That's why the locker room was toxic. Nobody liked Russell Wilson because he was treated like royalty when nobody else was. They resented that. That's why the offensive scheme was a disaster, because it wasn't a scheme. It was a hodgepodge of, here's what we do, and here's what you want to do, and I'll see if I can try to stitch this together. And Sean Payton is coming in and saying, this was a freaking joke. It continues. Wilson, a 12th year pro, uh, 12th year pro has employed a support staff for years that includes a personal athletic trainer, a strength and conditioning coach, and massage therapist. Yet boundaries were apparently blurred by the presence of Wilson's personal quarterback coach, Jake Hapes, or however you say the guy's name. He had a personal quarterback coach. The team provides you a quarterback coach. The team tells you, this is your quarterback coach. All these guys, uh, Jordan Love has a quarterback coach. He stays in California. He has his own business. He stays out there. Under no circumstances is he allowed to come in and usurp the role of quarterback coach. That is such an unbelievable thing. This, this freaking limp-wristed garbage. And part of the reason it frustrates me is I think, to some degree, Hackett learned it here. I don't like it. Again, can you imagine? We know Sean Payton's stance on this. Can you freaking imagine trying to tell Kyle Shanahan any of this stuff? Kyle Shanahan's a small, wiry dude. He would have kicked the living crap out of Russell Wilson if he had asked for all these things. Just right there in front of everybody. Just beat him right at the 50-yard line. Just to make a very clear point. It's amazing that Hackett allowed that stuff. And the Jets had better hope that Robert Sala has got the freaking backbone to set that kind of a structure in place to say, this is how it's going to be. I'm sure the offense is going to be basically whatever Rodgers wants. I mean, we heard that from Alan Lazard. What, what offense are you running? The Aaron Rodgers offense, he says. That doesn't surprise me. It's Nathaniel Hackett, and he just does whatever people tell him to do. Seems like a nice guy and all, but good lord. Anyways, it continues. Not anymore. When Peyton was hired in February, he made it clear that none of Wilson's team would have access to the team's facility. Which is not a radical position. You go back throughout history, and there are like seven coaches that would have allowed this, and Hackett is one of them. Can you imagine Bill Belichick? Oh my goodness. Diva Russell Wilson coming in saying, hey, I got my crew. This is Jay Dizzle. He's my trainer. I got my personal DJ. He's going to drop the beats while I'm working out. I think Bill Belichick would have just cut him. Like, I, how much do we pay him? I don't care. Get him out of here. I, 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 don't, I don't care. We can be in purgatory for the next 10 years. You can fire me along with it. I'm never working with this guy. Fire me. I, I'm not doing this. It's a joke. You know, we'll, we'll continue, but the consensus seems to be that Sean Payton is in the wrong. He shouldn't have said these things. Maybe he shouldn't have. I don't know. But everything he's saying is absolutely correct. This is a freaking joke of a football team last year. And the way that it was run was a complete and utter disaster. But he continues talking about this whole thing with, well, let me just back up. Not anymore. When Payton was hired in February, he made it clear that none of Wilson's team would have access to the team facility. Quote, that wasn't his fault, Payton said of Wilson. That was the parents who allowed it. That's not an incrimi incrimination of him, but an incrimination of the head coach, the GM, George Patton, the president, uh, Damani Leach, and everybody else who watched it all happen. For the record, Damani Leach is still the president of the Denver Broncos. But you know what? He was a first-time president last year. So you got a first-time president, first-time head coach, and these guys are all they, again, all they cared about was this big PR campaign thinking, hey, if we go get a superstar and bring him in, we're going to be great. Ta-da! Check that off the list. I did my job. Now we're great. 
and you allow this culture to just go to crap. George Patton is also still the GM. He got in one year earlier, so he was in in 2021. But still, a very young front office that apparently thought, you know what, let's just go pay people to fix things, which they're still kind of doing by getting Sean Payton. Right? Let's just throw more money at the problem. They may have gotten it right this time on accident. We'll see. But I think it's a completely incompetent organization from top to bottom. It doesn't surprise me George Patton got his start with the Chicago Bears, assistant director of pro personnel before he went to the Dolphins, then the Vikings, and then went from the Vikings to the Broncos. I mean, the guy has no clue how to run a franchise. He learned from the McCaskies. That's great. He continues, Now, a quarterback having an office and a place to watch film is normal, but all those things get magnified when you're losing. And that other stuff, I've never heard of it. We're not doing that. Says, yes, the culture has changed with the new sheriff in town. It will be reflected, too. In the, piece, uh, in the pace and tone of training camp, Hackett wouldn't play starters in preseason games and even kept them out of one-on-one -on -one drills in practice in an apparent effort for preservation. Under Peyton, who declared that they are prepared to play tackle football, it will be old-school intense, up to the point allowed by CBA rules. Soft is out. At the end of the day, no matter how soft they try to make football, football is always going to be football. And if you're not going to teach your football players to be tough, if you're not going to demand that, if you're not going to draft for that, you're going to fail. There's only so much that can be done through finesse. <laughs> Peyton says, everything I heard about last season, we're doing the opposite. Of course, Peyton has his way of expressing such to his team. Like his mentor Parcells, he is hardly short of ways of getting a message across. During the spring, Peyton had a video made that hammered home the point that the 2022 season was over and done with. The video included the montage of the team's equipment staff riding off in an orange 2022 Bronco with the rear view and side view mirrors removed. Also, a scene was edited in, uh, from the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, where John Candy's character drove the wrong way on a freeway, and the video included a shot of a truck driving off a cliff. That was a message, Peyton said. They can only beat the expletive out of you so much, but everybody's got a little stink on their hands. It's not just Russell. It was a poor offensive line. It might have been one of the worst coaching jobs in the history of the NFL. That's how bad it was. Now we're getting into sort of the controversy. Well, I guess the earlier part of the Jets was too, but saying that Hackett did one of the worst coaching jobs in the history of the NFL. But here's the thing. Can, can you deny it? We heard the stats about how rare it is for a first-time coach to be fired mid-season. It doesn't happen, but it happened in this case because it was that bad. And it was very obvious, like, you know, this idea, well, it's just Russell Wilson, he's just that bad. I've already stated I don't buy it. Yes, he was declining, and that's while well, he was getting worse. Yes, but it's like, just picture you go from 100 to 95 to 80 to 40. That seems a little bit more of a drastic plummet than I think would have been expected. Anyways, then he showed some iguana video, I guess. So look, there's um, a lot of opinions on this. There are some reports from people in Denver that people in Denver are pissed. Now, honestly, I wouldn't necessarily care. If I was a fan of the Denver Broncos, I wouldn't care if it was um, front office people that were mad. But if the locker room is upset, that potentially could be a problem. I don't know if it's, if it's that way or not. And, and listen, if Sean Payton has that, that much security, he might not care if the locker room doesn't like it either. Because the bottom line is we're going to change the way we do things. And if you don't fit into that, if you can't handle that, we'll get rid of you too. Because we are building a culture, and we need people that will help to build that culture. So you go ahead and throw a fit. I want you to, so I can root you out and get you out of here. And again, if his contract gives him a ton of security, the GM and everything, you be mad at me. I don't give a crap, because I'm just speaking the truth. Personally, I tend to think, if I had to guess, the locker room appreciates it. They hated the coaching staff. They hated the locker room. They hated the results on the field. They certainly hated Russell Wilson and the way he was being treated and the way that he acted. So to have somebody come in and say, enough of this bull crap, you talk to grown men, grown football players, and say, we're not going to be soft anymore, we're going to be hard, and we're going to punch people in the mouth, I promise you that resonates. And I know another prevailing theory is he's really just distracting from how bad the team is. In other words, he watched the team, he said, oh man, this team is terrible, and they're about to flop, so I'm going to say that it was the other team's fault, but I don't think so. I think if you look at everything in its totality, he flat out said Russell Wilson's still a good quarterback. He didn't give himself a parachute there. He said, we wash them a uh, hundred times and we're going to make this better. You know, you, you, you can't say Russell Wilson still has it. And then if he plays like he did last year, what's your excuse now? I guess you're just as bad of a coach because I thought he still had it and you couldn't put it together either. 
But the reality is that, I mean, we're, we're just denying what is painfully obvious. The Broncos were way worse than they should have been. Russell Wilson was way worse than he should have been. He gave examples. They were, they were terrible at getting play calls in on offense and defense. It was, it was, it was just from top to bottom an, an, an administrative disaster. And we watched it happen. I don't, I don't see the need for a conspiracy theory about, oh, I guess it really is that bad. We, we know who the players are. I understand the, the, the general dislike of, it, it reminds me of the Minnesota Vikings conversation, where it's like, man, they're about to regress. And it's like, you do realize they can regress significantly and still have more wins than everybody else in the NFC North, right? It's a similar thing here, where it's like, well, I think they're actually just bad. I understand what bad is, but I don't know how you go get Russell Wilson and get worse. Yeah, his, his final year in Seattle, things dropped off. He had a 74 PFF grade down from a 90. He was still good, though. That's the point. Like, you know, but he was the 20, what was it, 26th ranked quarterback out of 41. He ranked 26th as a passer with a 64 passing grade. I just don't think he's that bad. He, you understand, he was the number one quarterback in football, like, Four years ago, he was top five, two years. In, I mean, he was, he was top five for like three years in a row, but he had a 90 PFF grade in 2020. I don't think he just forgot everything. Maybe he's too distracted with his stupid dangerous and all this nonsense going on. I don't know. But I, I just, I see no reason to assume that Denver just as a team collapsed and it wasn't the coaching. It was just, no, the players are just bad. So, you know, I don't know. Should he have said it? Maybe not. Maybe keep that in-house. Maybe don't take an interview with USA Today so that you can vent. And, th- and that is generally the, the thought process is, why, what, you know, why would you do it unless you wanted to put it out there? Fair enough. But the question then is just, why did you want to put it out there? And again, the prevailing thought by most people seems to be, he's just scared because the team is bad and he's trying to cover himself. But again, the, the words that he said, it, it doesn't resonate. Because he basically put it all on the line. First of all, he said playoffs. First thing he said, I'm going to be pissed if we're not in the playoffs. Why would you say that if you know you're not going to the playoffs and you're going to be a terrible football team? It makes no sense. First words out of his mouth. Then he goes on to say, Russell Wilson still has it. He's still a good quarterback. Why would you say that? Because I think we're just deliberately making something up that doesn't really make sense. I think he's genuine in what he's saying. And I think he's deflecting blame off of his players for the most part, saying that, you know, trying to get them to realize you guys are a really good football team. Do not get caught up in what happened last year. I think, he is, I think he's also completely frustrated with how much he's had to undo, how much w- extra work he's had to do that he's never had to do when he was with the Saints because they had a smooth operation. He's had to come in and tear down everything, and he's freaking pissed. And he's sacrificing Nathaniel Hackett at the altar for his team, saying, you guys weren't the problem. That guy was the worst coach in history, and I am so sorry that you had to be subjected to that garbage. And he even threw his bosses under the bus. I think that was a demonstration to his team. I think he's appealing to his team and just demonstrating what he's tr- been trying to demonstrate in private the entire time. And I think by saying I'm not afraid to, to say it to everybody is a part of that. It's grown man stuff, which is the, the message to the team. No more softball. No more weak garbage. I'm going to speak the truth and I'm going to say it to whoever I want. If anybody doesn't like it, they can come say it to my face. Period. Now, again, was he right or wrong? I, I don't know, but I, I guess I'm just saying I'm not buying this whole he got in there, realized his team is going to be a disaster, and now he's deflecting, saying, well, all the problems here are his fault. Because, again, if you actually read all the words, that doesn't hold up. And really, if you listen to Diana Rossini, you know, she's talking about, first of all, the, the team has no issue with it. I'm talking about the players. Partially because this is the way he talks all the time, so they're not surprised by anything that he's said. She said they're very impressed with the work that he's done. And I think the bigger point is she said that this is a demonstration of Sean Payton putting the team on his back, which again is the opposite of what a lot of people are saying right now. But I think it makes more sense. It's saying he's putting the pressure on himself and off of his players, saying you guys are not to blame for what happened last year. It was a coaching failure. And your success this year will be dependent on my ability to change that. That's the message. Of course, there is still, you know, expectations, but he's going to tell you, I expect you to do X, Y, and Z. But the point is, if you do what I ask you to do, everything else is up to me. Um, I think, you know, Eric Mangini, who was on uh, First Things First or whatever, he probably said it best. When you get a little bit older and you've experienced success and you got a lot of money, you tend to become much more honest. I think that's all this is. I do. I, I think that's all it is. He's being honest. Anyways, we'll see how this all comes back together. I mean, I, I do think the Broncos are kind of a disaster. 
Um, I think they've been overhyped for a long time in terms of, you know, they're, they're so good. They just need a quarterback. I don't think that's a hundred percent true. I, I think they're good. At, they're significantly better than what they were last year and they should improve. Um, but we'll see, you know, it's, it's a drastic change and how much can a coach do in one year? Um, I mean, just instilling a culture from the ground up, much less a scheme. Um, and then of course, everybody's got Jets Broncos circled on their calendars. And again, as much, um, as much as I appreciate Sean Payton's approach to things, and I respect what I think he's going to do, um, it's it's tough for me to put a vote of confidence in the Broncos over the Jets. But it's entirely possible. I mean, the Jets could be a complete disaster. The Broncos could be a great team. The Broncos were supposed to be a great team last year, and they were a disaster. So now that we all expect them to be a disaster, who's to say that they're not going to be great? I have no idea. But anyways, I found it interesting. It's kind of fun. It's a, sort of an off-season fun thing to have a coaching feud it was uh who was that um the sean mccoy was all geeked out about we got coach beef i hope that doesn't die out man it's it's something fun and entertaining and and again i just i just appreciate it maybe, maybe he was a little out of line i don't know but um i just i just like that attitude i mean he's not going to mince words he's going to say exactly how he feels about things and yeah, he's he's going to look at Hackett and say, you frickin' caused a disaster over here. I've spent months cleaning up your frickin' mess. You suck as a coach. I don't know how you keep getting hired. You're a freaking disaster. And I don't like you. <laughs> You've made my life hell. And then to have the gall to, to stand up to the, the GM and team president and basically say they ruined this team. And I'm in here trying to fix their mess. I mean, that takes some gall, man. I just, I don't know. I, I respect it. And to a small degree, I'm I'm rooting for them. Of course, I don't really want to root for any team. I hope every team that isn't the Green Bay Packers is a freaking disaster. Doesn't matter if it's the Bears or the Lions or the Vikings or the Jets or the Broncos. I want the Chiefs to fail. I want everyone to fail. If there was a, a way for every team to win one game except the Packers, I would root for that outcome. Of course, that's not possible. Anyways, why don't we take a break here? Please remember to check out grassfedcooperative.com. Just look at what they offer. See if any of that would be interested, uh, interesting to you. They've got, for example, Rancher's Choice Steak Box with free shipping. Uh, the Ranch Connector Box says, In it you'll find um, five one-pound vacuum-sealed packages of dry-aged ground beef taking traditional family favorites like burgers, meatloaf, spaghetti, and chili to the next level. And if you really want to go all out, you can get things like the one-half custom grass-fed beef deposit. Purchasing a one-half of grass-fed beef is an economical way to enjoy the many health and taste benefits of grass-fed meat. Each purchase includes all cuts for a fraction of what it would cost to buy each cut separately. Not only does it save you money, but it also gives you more choices when deciding how to prepare your meals. You can customize meals with different recipes by utilizing dozens of options in this one-half grass-fed beef package, which includes steaks, roasts, and ground beef. So just go check them out, grassfedcooperative.com. Remember, you can use promo code PACKER10, capital P, and you will get 10% off of your order. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular. Exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you're here in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is and not and, as uh, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. All right, so um, over at Go Long, which you do have to pay for, however, he does these videos, which are, you know, just for 
his subscribers, but he puts them on YouTube and YouTube is free. So if you go subscribe to Go Long over at YouTube, you'll see Go Long Happy Hour. Andrew Brandt explains the game. So I, I we're not going to cover everything, but I would encourage you to go check it out because uh, one of the cooler things about it is Andrew Brandt talks about his entire path to becoming what he became. And, and first of all, just learning a little bit more about what his job was. But, um, I mean, just, you know, how... You always hear those stories about how if, if one little minor thing changed, my whole life would have been different, right? He wanted to stay in California, go to, I forget which school it was, but he didn't get in. So he ended up going out to D.C., right? And so, and he wanted to be a, a professional tennis player. Turns out he wasn't good enough. So he gets in with, uh, you know, this, these agents and whatnot, and he finds this little niche because mostly these guys are covering like Michael Jordan, like big basketball guys. And um, turns out there's not a big market within their company covering football players. So he decides to go that route to kind of find his little niche, kind of similar to um, what we heard about Mike McDaniel, realizing that there's a little niche in the run game. And that's kind of how he made his name. And so it just built from there. So you get to hear how from there he ends up with the Green Bay Packers and why he made the decision to make the switch from a player agent to VP and why the Packers wanted him what his role was, all that stuff. Very, very, very cool story. And why he's been so vocal about everything, right? I mean, it, uh, uh, I just thought he was just some guy that was just tweeting just because he felt like it. But apparently he's talking about like that's his mission in a sense is to help educate people along the way and kind of peel back the, the curtain a little bit and, and show people things. So I'm actually a little bit more interested in learning what else he's been doing. I've I just been catching his tweets. I just thought he was kicking back on a beach somewhere, just tweeting stuff for fun. But um, I'm thinking that there's some other avenues in which he is actually teaching people things um, about that side of the business, and I'd be interested in kind of delving into that. But anyways, um, aside from that, the, the, one of the benefits of being a subscriber to Go Long, I've never done it. I probably should do it. I should actually, what I should do, tell you when these things are coming up so that I can solicit questions from you, because it's just a big Zoom call and you can ask questions. That would be kind of cool. And then we could <laughs> it would be kind of like a way of interviewing Brand on the podcast. <laughs> um, but anyways. Oh, he he also ran a football team in Europe. Just throw that little nugget out there. But anyways, I'll I'll you know, go find it and listen. It's a it's a really awesome story. It's also one of those things that makes me feel stupid because it's like you know there's so many people that end up in great positions because they're just they're working really hard, making good decisions, and constantly moving forward. You know, they're not stagnating. It's 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 doing a great job here then taking the next best opportunity and just continuing that, and you just work your way up. Read so many books. I mean, that's just anybody who gets to the top. That's just, you read these books, and you just see that, right? I became great at this, and then this opportunity, and then I took it. And, and maybe some of it is luck, right? A lot of people, it's, it's like one of those pick-your-path story books or whatever, and you pick the wrong path, and these people just happen to take all the right paths at the right time to end up on top. But anyways, it, it, it is very, very cool, and I love hearing stuff like that. But I want to start with this. I mean, he he's, I don't want to say long-winded. He does a good job of, of um, telling stories and making it very, very interesting and compelling, especially as a Packer fan, but trying to find a way to condense it. But I, I want to start kind of in the middle. And listen, we know this story already. We understand. We've heard the story. And this, this all kind of comes from talking about Ted Thompson and the person that he was. But it's the story of Aaron Rodgers. It's a story that he wasn't supposed to be there. You know, we know we know the story Ted put on the tape. Like, what if they ran through some scenarios and it's like, could he possibly fall? And like, well, maybe. So they looked at the tape. They loved it, whatever. He ended up falling. Boom. Rogers, done deal, right? We know that story. But I want to kind of hammer it home because, again, the, the parallels are, are unbelievable. But I also want to make sure that we dig in a little bit deeper as to the background of what was going on. It wasn't like this big thing where Rodgers is this elite player. Could he possibly fall? He fell. They drafted him and everybody cheered and celebrated. The majority of the team hated, hated, hated the pick. They could hear downstairs. They had a draft party. The boos shook the building after they took the pick. Here's what he said, though. It'll be the first pick in the draft. And... <laughs> And it's becoming clear, like, oh, my God, it's going to be here. And you could feel the coaches start to combust because coaches are judged by immediate results. And they're just making noise and pulling me and saying, listen, Andrew, no way. No way. God, no, don't. Because if we take that kid, he won't help us this year, maybe not next year, maybe never. Maybe never. 
How familiar does that sound to you? He's not going to help us this year. He's not going to help us next year. He might never help us. Does that sound familiar? I, I know as somebody who's been defending that pick for years that I've heard that mantra a thousand times. Why would you take him when you could have had T. Higgins who could have helped you immediately? I've heard that a thousand times. You know, we had the most durable quarterback in the history of the sport playing at a high level. Why would we take a quarterback? So there was a lot of heat in that room. And Ted just said what he always says, trust the board. Trust the board. The board is saying that's the player. That's it. We could have dipped down to our second round grade, took in a, taken a defensive lineman, but no. And even with... Let me, let me just... The, the point of what I'm trying to isolate here and you can disagree with me, and that's fine. But just understand, this is not me just saying Gutekunst is God and I believe whatever he says. I am a, you could say, Ted Thompsonite. And I choose Ted Thompson because when I came up as a Packer fan and started actually learning the way that the Packers do things, it was Ted Thompson. I mean, I was clearly old enough to be around when, when this was prior to Ted Thompson, but um, Ted Thompson had a reputation. It was a reputation that he learned, and it's a reputation that he taught and he passed on. And I've always, I shouldn't say always, I didn't understand it, and I didn't like it for a long time. But the more time I spent really delving into it, because it was it's pounded into all of our heads, right? We heard it when they go to the podium and they'd ask the question, why would you do this when you could have done that? And it's, you never know what your problems are going to be coming up. You never know these things, and that's a reality. And so it's 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 really just... The best thing you can do is to take the best player available. In Ted Thompson's words, trust the board. And so when I look back at Brian Gutekunst and I judge him, because everybody wants me to judge him, right? Because it's, I'm, I'm just a, a, a Brian Gutekunst sycophant. Ted Thompson will be judged, in, in, for me, based on his process and whether or not he follows a successful process that gave us great football for a very long time. And no, not just because of the quarterbacks, because of great people like Ron Wolf who instilled the right way to do things. I mean, this is what we talked about in the first half of the program. Sean Payton's coming in and instilling the right way to do things. There, there's still a right way to do things from a coaching perspective, from a player perspective, how things operate, how you do things. It matters. And so at the end of the day, if Jordan Love is terrible, am I going to be mad at the pick? No. No, I'm not. Because he did exactly what Ted Thompson would have done. He did exactly what Ron Wolf would have done. He did the right thing. Drafting best player available doesn't mean everybody you pick is going to be great. Right? Again, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like betting in Vegas. You're just trying, in order to beat the house, it doesn't mean you win every time. It just means you pull in more money than what you lose. But you're losing a lot. You're just trying to stay ahead of everybody else. And, and really, the, the best way to do that is to make sure that you have good players. You trust your board. They had a lot of other players that they liked, including Justin Jefferson, and he was gone. And at the end of the day, they were, they were stuck in the same situation. We've got a, one guy left that is a first-round pick. We can dip into our second round. We could say, forget it. I don't want to upset Aaron. He's a little delicate. I don't want to upset the fans. I don't want the media pressure. Let's just go get a, whatever we need. Let's go get a wide receiver. Make everybody happy. Or we can do what I was brought in here to do, and that is to trust the board. That's what I was taught by Ted Thompson to do. That is a tradition that has been passed down. And if I'm not going to stick to that, that is the most fun fundamental and foundational piece of what the Packers do. Draft and develop. If we lose that part of our identity, we are not the Green Bay Packers anymore. We're the New York freaking Jets. We're the, the Atlanta Falcons when they blatantly came out and said we draft for need. It was Dimitrov, I think, was the guy that said that. And that is blatantly obvious that that is the wrong thing to do. And so again, and we'll, he'll talk more about this in a second, the things that Gutekunst has done that I don't like are the things that depart from what Ted would have done, from what Ron Wolf would have done, the things that departed from tradition because he panicked. Because Aaron Rodgers is, is real good and he knows that there's just a small window left and he did everything he could to try to cram that in there and it didn't work. He tried to abandon the philosophy and go all in and spend all the money and push all the money out and do all the things to make sure that we can keep all our elite talent so we don't have to start cutting them, and it didn't work. And my hope 
is that moving forward, we, we will get back to what we were. And fortunately, to some degree, we still have. We've had a ton of draft picks in this time. He's done a fantastic job of accumulating the draft picks. I also think he's done a fantastic job of drafting, period. And we'll see how it pans out, but I'm I'm happy with how he's done it, and I'm happy with the fact that he understands that it is, it is an imperfect science, and the best way to get good players is to maximize the amount of picks that you have, especially premium picks. How many times have we had two first-round picks? Lots of times, and we may have another one next year. It's a very unusual thing to have even once, much less more than once. I mean, teams that are terrible can make trades, and then they get multiple first-round picks. But teams that are picking in the 20s every year, it's hard to find a way to manufacture multiple first-round picks, but Gutekunst has done it. Multiple first, multiple seconds, whatever. Never rang. So we took him, and I just never forget the 20 seconds after we took him, because Brett called the coach, Sherman. Brett's agent, Bus Cook, called me, always screaming, what the F, what the F. And then we had a draft party at Lambeau Field. I'll never forget it, as long as I live. Right under us right under us, thousand people. And the booing in that room literally shook our souls. Literally. Like you heard it come through the, the, the floor, just booing <laughs> within seconds. And we're all looking at each other like, oh my God, no one likes this pick. And poor Aaron, you know, coming to a place that's cold and He's never going to play, you know? So, and then I've talked about this many times, those three years, 2005 to eight, a, a part of my job was trying to manage that. So you had, you know, California cool coming into country Mississippi. And of course they did not get along. Um, and, and Brett's, you know, Brett's talking all the time, like, you know what it's like coming to work every day and sitting with your replacement? It sucks. And Aaron's camp is like, he's never going to play. You got to trade him. You know, he's never going to play there. So it was just that constant thing. And I know they went through that again the last three years. It had They had to because players want to play. And if you're a first rounder, you're going to play. It's just a question of when. So what people don't realize about running an NFL team is so much of it is personality and egos and trying to keep everyone happy when there's only so many, so much playing time. So again, how many possible parallels could there be? He mentions, first of all, after that pick, his phone's blowing up. Brett Favre is on the phone calling. Brett Favre's agent calls him directly. What the F are you doing? Furious, right? Um, again, Rodgers and Favre, one of the, the only stark differences in this whole thing is the way that the young guy was treated. Rodgers treated um, Jordan very well, and Brett did not treat Rodgers very well. I don't think Rodgers treated Brett very well either. I think that's just they just clashed. Like he said, it was, it was culture clash, and um, I think Brett... There, there maybe is a scenario where he could have been cool to Rodgers, but Rodgers came in cocky and arrogant and kind of had this, like, I'm going to take your job mentality, calling him an old man and whatnot, and Brett was just like, oh, screw you real hard, bro. Um, but anyways, even still, that doesn't mean Rodgers handled it any better in terms of his thought process. It doesn't mean he was any less upset about coming in and having to work with his replacement. It doesn't mean he was any less upset with the Green Bay Packers when they made that call. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. And, and like you said, so much of this is just managing egos and trying to keep everybody happy, and it's just an impossible thing. And I'm sure they've dealt with it with Jordan and his agent saying, you know, look, I mean, especially after that contract, you give Aaron Rodgers a brand new contract, it's like, okay, you know what, trade him. There, there had to have been a phone call. Like the second that that broke... Within minutes, there needed to have been a phone call from Jordan Love's agent to the Green Bay Packers saying, are you going to trade him or what? Like, th this is ridiculous. Anyways, he tells a little aside here about um, something that happened later after Rodgers was on the team for a little while. He, t You know, he's running second team. He takes the uh, handoff and he rolls right and flicks it 65 yards right in the hands of Donald Driver. And we kind of look at each other, all the front office, like, oh, we we got something like 
this is real. He became a favorite of all of us because he's just an easy guy to talk to and smart off the charts. And the thing that he, we saw with Aaron that they saw with Jordan Love this past couple of years is that, you know, Brett went to Mississippi in the off season. Aaron stayed away the last two off seasons. That lets you see the guy. You know, we saw Aaron run the team for two off seasons. And we had Greg Jennings and James Jones, you know, coming up to the office like, hey, this guy's for real, like big time. And uh, they were doing that with Jordan in the past two years, too. They were saying, you know, all those young players saying, oh, my God, this guy is amazing. So that's what happens. So fantastic insight and and again it's just the the absolute perils when 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 rogers was young he was young he was hungry he was intelligent and he worked really really hard right and so you you've got these guys that are getting burnt out with brett the i'm i'm going to play i'm not going to play the the diva attitude the you know constant battling over the contract you know it just gets to be tiring and and it's all about expectations and at the same time you're getting older um and so that causes a lot of stress because he can feel that the team is is just waiting for an excuse to get rid of you. That's every older player, right? When you get older, I'm just waiting for you to twist your ankle or something and you're out of here. So he knows that and he's also a big shot and he needs he he doesn't need any more money. He's set for life, all that stuff. I was presuming you don't blow it all or do stupid things. Um and so that there's just this tension. And then on top of that, you're not putting in the work. Brett leaves in the offseason. Like, no, I'm not. And he, he would flat out say, I'm not, I'm just not coming. I'm not coming in. I'm not doing any of that practicing crap. And what happens? Rodgers does it. And then you get these young receivers. He had a very similar situation with brand spanking new receivers, young guys that have been there for, they're either rookies or, or first year, second year, whatever, working with Rodgers. And he said they would come up to the front office to guys like Andrew Brandt and say, dude, seriously. This guy is legit. And he's saying that's the exact same thing that happened with Jordan over the last couple of years. First of all, Aaron's not coming in. Same thing. Like he went from being one way early to a different way later. He says he was easy to talk to. Good Lord. Do you think Gutekunst thinks he's easy to talk to? Of course not. He can't get him on the phone. It's hard to call a guy easy to talk to when he doesn't answer your phone calls. Right? It's just a different thing. He he went from, and, and he talks about this too, like th there was a transformation with Rogers When he came in, he was a small town guy. You know, he's dating a local girl and, you know, he, he just, he, I mean, he's always been kind of ego, but, but he became Mr. Hollywood. Living in LA, now he's going out to New York, the big billboards, owner of the Bucks, co-owner, part owner, whatever, nominal owner, whatever you want to call it. There was a change and, and, and I think that stuff happened. It happened to Brett, it happened to Aaron, it's going to, potentially happen to Jordan over time. It's not not saying it has to happen to everybody, but you know, you, you you start to sour on the older guy who's not putting in the work, who's giving you a bunch of grief. He's getting older, you know you need to move on. He's getting pissed about the fact that you know that you know it just it just creates that tension. And then yeah, he's according to Andrew Brandt, the same thing happened to Green Bay with young now maybe he's just assuming, I don't know, or maybe he has some insight, but he said the same thing was happening with young players like Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs whoever else it may have been, maybe the running backs, Aaron Jones seems to be a big supporter, Josiah DeGuara, whatever, guys are going up to the front office and saying, this guy is legit. Like, he's the real deal. And ultimately, Andrew Brandt says that's the reason they decided to move on, or, or that it was time to move on. I mean, on, again, on one hand, the Rodgers thing is just coming to an edge, uh, coming to an end. One way or another, like, this is, this is a car careening off a cliff, and we have to jump out of this car. It's just a matter of, like, what are we jumping to? But I, I, I think, and I think Andrew Brandt's um, position on this is they felt comfortable jumping out because they felt like Jordan actually did turn the corner. Now, who knows if that's real? The Packers don't even know if that's real. They don't know what that's going to materialize into, but they at least had something to fall onto. But again, this, this Rogers car is going off a cliff, period. I mean, it's, it's, he's going to retire. I mean, he did, he literally did retire and then he asked for a trade. Yeah. You know, the idea that it's like, he's like, oh, okay, I can't wait to play another year with green Bay. And the Packers are like, nope, you're out of here. Stupid. That's not what happened. We're getting a little bit late here. There's a lot of stuff I want to cover, but here, here's a little anecdote. Uh, the question was asked about Randy Moss. Like, how real was it that Randy was actually going to come here? And here's what he had to say. I think he was kind of put up for sale by the Raiders and because uh, they had had enough of him. And we looked into it and Brett pushed it, but, 
you know, on the contract side, I remember he was only going to do a one year deal because he wanted to set himself up for a huge deal the next year. And Ted wouldn't do a one year deal. You know, we weren't going to do a one year deal and set him up to go somewhere else. Um, we wanted two years, even a big number in the second year. And the Patriots gave him a one year and then the Patriots gave him a massive deal six months later. Anyways, aside from that just being somewhat interesting, just to see him behind the curtain, uh, the, the thing that I like about it is, again, there are a lot of parallels with what we've seen in the past. You know, Packer fans screaming, what about this wide receiver? We've seen a ton of stud wide receivers, or at least big name wide receivers, not necessarily studs, but wanting something. And then what happens? The quarterback pushes it. Just like Brett pushed for wide receivers to come here, Aaron used to push for wide receivers to come. But again, on the administrative side, Ted would look at it and go, mm, no, I'm sorry, it's stupid. And it, it's not, you know, we always just look at it as like, you know, this is a megastar, how could you not? And it's like, it's it's not really the point. And I don't know if we're going to even get there or not, but Andrew at some point says, you know, the, the, the way that the Packers operate is draft and develop and avoid free agency, right? Which no Packer fan wants to hear that, but that's that's what it comes down to. And so when you hear a free agent, it's like, okay, look... Maybe, but it's got to be on these terms. And of course, it's not going to be great terms. This is why the Packers very rarely actually get things done. You always hear about uh, Brian Gutekunst is in on every call, which is a departure from Ted. And I think it's the right way to do things. Just because it might not be your favorite thing to do doesn't mean you aren't exploring all options. I think you, the maximizing information is, is a requirement. But at the end of the day, when you make a call, you're probably not making the most appealing offer if you're the Green Bay Packers because you generally just don't value free agents as much as the rest of the NFL does. So you offer a contract that is what you value them at, and they're probably going to be able to find something better somewhere else. And I think that happened a lot here. I mean, we we saw it with um, Odell Beckham, right? Aaron Rodgers pushed real hard for Odell. Now, he always wanted to go to L.A. is is the, the, the rumor. But the Packers did apparently offer him a contract. But the point is, it wasn't an appealing enough contract. Now, maybe they could have offered, you know, 10 times as much and it wouldn't have been as appealing as an offer from L.A. But I, I just think that's that's a common thing. And it may be even more common going forward. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to have presumably a, a good chunk of money going into next year, which will be great. And the Packers will spend that. They will find um, avenues that may be taken up by some of the contracts that we have offer you know with Rashawn Gary and whatnot offering these guys some big money that may soak up a little bit of that but you know they'll they'll backfill in a few areas in free agency but I don't necessarily think this is going to be like a 2019 all over again where we're just building from scratch um and with a veteran quarterback like let's see if we can make a push real quick while he's here I, I guess I should say I'm curious to see how things go moving forward are we going to get back to structuring contracts as Andrew Brandt says trying to keep cap and cash as similar as possible, which is to say, if we're paying you $10 million in cash, I want the cap hit to be as close to $10 million as is humanly possible. That's just, a, that's just a way to have good, conservative, sound financials. Or are we going to continue this trend of pushing money out? And I think you can make a, a case for uh, pushing some money out being the right thing to do. Uh, I think the, the best argument would have to be with the inflation of the salary cap. But I also don't think you necessarily need to push money out in order to do that. I think you can just make the pay go larger incrementally and have cash and cap stay the same as it goes along, right? You're, you're going to make $5 million this year, and that's going to be our cap hit. It's going to go up to $10 million next year. That's going to be our cap hit. It's going to go up to $20 million after that, and then it'll be 22 23 whatever. You know, we generally see these incremental steps. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to push all the cap out and then pay all the cash up front. I mean, that's a separate thing. Anyways, let's end with this. There was a question asked by, uh, looks like Chris here, um, about the Packers' seeming deviation from doing the cap sort of a, from a conservative standpoint or whatever. Uh, anyways, here's what Andrew's thoughts are on all that stuff. Yeah, Chris, I think, you know, I'm pretty conservative by nature, and I express that in the way I've handled the cap. I always believed in... Cap management as pay as you go. And that really is trying to match cash and cap as much as possible. So if you're playing a, paying a player, say $10 million year one, and that's his cash, I'd try to get the cap as close to that as I can. What these crazy teams like those Saints and Rams do all the time is minimum out the salary and bonus out everything else so they can get as low a cap in the first year as possible and push out the problems to later. I just saw that not work from my experience. So I did. So I was very hesitant to go to Brett's, which was obviously the biggest contract. And 
what we say in the industry called touch it every year. And when you touch it, you basically bonus out a big salary, turn it into prorated signing bonus. So you have a low cap and you push out all that proration into future years. It's going to hit you later. So yes, I didn't do much of it. And Reinfeld, our, our history of the Packers wasn't doing much of it. My successor wasn't doing much of it. But as you rightly point out, They've been doing a lot of it in the past couple of years. And I think this is this whole, whatever happened to the Packers with Aaron over the last three years, I don't know what it is because obviously they took Jordan Love to replace him. But I think that COVID year when Aaron was MVP, everything changed. I think the Packers went to a win now philosophy and pushed all the chips to the middle the contract they gave Aaron in 2022. Again, for those of you who are win now people saying that the Packers didn't do that, they absolutely did. They didn't win, which I know in your mind, win now just means win the Super Bowl, but that's not correct. The The Packers did shift to a win now philosophy and it didn't work. That's just the reality of the situation. Who is very unpacker like giving him total control. Yeah, so I, I kind of talked over it there. Very important part. The contract they gave Aaron Rodgers was very unpacker like and gave Aaron Rodgers complete control. So what is my position on that contract given to Aaron Rodgers? I don't like it. I don't like anything about it. I'm glad that it's going to be gone after this year and we're going to be fine. But that was a disaster. And 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 it proved to be. So again, Gutekunz deviates from the Packer way, if you will. And it was a bad decision. It was. I, I just feel like Gutekunst has panicked these last couple of years. He really felt like we had something. I know he had made a comment, and it was it was a Ted Thompson type of thing, so I think he maybe in some sense felt like he was doing, you know, what he's supposed to do as a Green Bay Packers GM, and, and the philosophy was when, you know, something to the effect of when you have a really good quarterback, you you, you cannot let him go, and I feel like that's where he was at. Right? Like, I, whatever it takes, we, we can't let this guy go out the door. I don't like him. He hates me. He tried to get me fired. Um, but we got to do whatever it takes. And if that means giving him a contract that gives him complete control and going out and, and getting uh, Randall Cobb and whatever else he wants, then I guess that's, a, that's what we got to do to get him to say yes, to make sure he's in the building and playing football. But I think in a much larger sense, he really deviated from how the Packers win. I think he felt like we were so close, he just kind of got a little greedy and said, if we got to pay for this down in the future, then so be it. But we're going we're gonna to do everything we can to make sure that we invest in these years with Rodgers. And um, again, from my standpoint, he didn't follow the way that the Packers generally do things. I think it was a bad decision. And I think it didn't work. And I want to get back to doing things the right way. Now, again... The right way does mean drafting Jordan Love. It doesn't mean keeping Aaron Rodgers and giving him that stupid contract. There is, there, there really is just sort of this cold emotionlessness to being a GM that I appreciate. Ted Thompson looking at a superstar going, nah, I'm only doing a two-year. Well, he wants a one-year. He's a megastar. He could change everything. You know, you, you can't get whipped up into that stuff. And I think owners get whipped up, and that's why owners suck, because they push that onto their GMs and force things like that. I think some GMs get whipped up in that. I think some coaches get whipped up in that. Much like the Jets with Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson with the Denver Broncos, there's so much just, oh, can you imagine? It's going to be so amazing. And fans do that. And that's fine. You're a fan. You're supposed to do that. But I don't want the GM to do that. I don't want him to panic and think, oh, man, we're so close. We're so close. What can we do? Like, let's do it. Let's just go all in, man. We got to do this while he's here. Don't do that. Stay the course. Trust the process, trust the board, et cetera, et cetera. I think Gutekunst has 90% of the way done that. I think he's done an unbelievable job in his acquisition of um, talent, both in the draft as well as through free agency or, or any other process of acquiring pro personnel. I hate the contracts. I hate the contracts, period. And again, I just hope that this is a short-term thing where he wanted to try. And now we're back to the way that it was. And, you know, one of the things, and maybe it's coming up, I don't know, but we're just going to be done. One of the things he mentioned is when you're a draft and develop team, those young guys got to play. That was the philosophy of the Green Bay Packers. You're gonna, it's trial by fire. You got to go out there. You got to play. And the Packers have not been that recently. 
And one of the things he mentions is coaches don't like that. And we know Rodgers didn't like that. So I think Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers probably agreed, along with Joe Barry and everybody else, we don't feel comfortable with these young guys coming out there. But from a front office standpoint, I don't give a crap. This is how we do it. This is how we win. The young guys have to play because they have to develop. That's what a draft and develop team does. And so what I would like to see is to return to that philosophy of the young guys got to play. Sink or swim, trial by fire. Jordan's got to play, obviously. Christian, Romeo, Jaden. And Jaden is one of the main ones here. We know by default Christian and Romeo are going to be out there. But I don't want there to be any question about Jaden. Even if, let's say, Samori Ture is looking a little bit better, he understands things a little bit better, I don't care because we know that Jaden Reed is the future. And if he's the guy we're going to depend on to win games, then the sooner we can get him caught up to speed, the better. Stunting their growth is only stunting our opportunities. Get everybody up to speed as fast as is humanly possible. Take the lumps. The young interior defensive lineman, put him on the field. Lucas Van Ness, dude's got to play. I mean, do you think Kingsley and Igbari is the future? When Preston leaves, it's going to be Rashawn and Kingsley, or is it going to be Rashawn and Lucas Van Ness? I mean, we don't know, but what, what is the plan here? If it's Lucas, put Lucas on the field. Like I said, a lot of these guys, it's year two. For Rashawn, it was year three, because in three years, he had as many snaps as a lot of guys had in two years. So it was about the exact same amount of snaps before Rashawn hit. But we stunted our own growth and opportunity. And we had an entire year that Rashawn could have dominated the league but didn't because we stunted his own growth and told him to sit on the bench. Now, I understand Preston and Zedarius were good football players and all, but he could have had, should have had more opportunity. But we didn't want that because he wasn't ready. He wasn't very good. He wasn't as good as Zedarius. He wasn't as good as Preston. And so it's going to hurt us a little bit in the, in the immediate, but it's going to help us throughout our future. And what, what a lot of people refuse to understand who are so focused on the now, the now only covers... Now, the future covers multiple years. If you're not willing to sacrifice one year for the next five, there's something wrong with you. This is how you win. You sacrifice one for five. You make that trade every single time. So this has all just been essentially two things. It's understanding the Packers process and understanding my thought process, which is... um largely, I guess we'll say, aligned with the Packers. I don't know everything about the Packers. And again, you can even look at Ted Thompson being just outright refusing to engage in free agency, which I think was he was a little too extreme in that regard. And I actually prefer Brian Gutekunst's approach to things um, in regard to free agency, not just because he seems to be better at it, but, um, you know, with, with, with his making every single phone call and being in every single conversation, I agree with. But that's it. And, and you can disagree with the process. You can disagree with all of this. But I, the only thing I'll say is I would encourage you to develop a actual solid process. Don't just be... This isn't a freaking buffet where just in the moment I get to pick and choose what I think is the right thing. That's not a philosophy. That's not a process. That's you living on a whim. Find a philosophy and a process that you align to. Learn it. Understand it. And then go and you know, live it, experience it, find teams that are doing it. And, and what are their results? And I don't just mean, well, I, I think the Rams did the right thing. I'm a Ram truther and they won the Super Bowl and they're great. That's stupid because it wasn't just the Rams and that's not a philosophy. You need to find out what specifically that philosophy is, find everyone that's doing it and what the results of those things are. What does that mean? What is the success rate? What, what, what generally happens when you do this? What does your cap look like? What does your uh, roster look like? What, how many times do you actually benefit? What, what are the long-term consequences? Look at the Rams now. Take all of it. Don't just find one good thing and say, I want that. Because they did that one thing and now they won. Because that's not how that works. Because you can't just say, if you just do exactly what they did, then you'll win. That's, that's false. Lots of people are doing that exact same thing every single year and they're not winning. So I don't mind disagreeing, but actually have something that you agree with. Don't just disagree. Find something you agree with. Then we can have conversations or discussions about it. Because I'm, I'm, again, a lot of this is new to me, and I'm, I'm still developing my thoughts on a lot of different things. Having almost no knowledge in comparison to a guy like Andrew Brandt, there's a lot of room for somebody to propose something to me and for me to go, holy crap, that's a good point. I mean, just look at the, you know, the analytics thing, which I've been much more involved in recently how many things you know i again i just didn't buy the whole running isn't valuable thing but you just they lay the data in front of you and it's like what am i supposed to do how do you disagree with this i mean it's just sitting there staring at you and then you look at the nfl they're clearly going in that direction 
it feels like it shouldn't be that way, but my feelings don't matter. I feel like I watch Aaron Jones and that guy is crucial to our team, but data doesn't back that up. So what am I supposed to do? Say, I don't care, my feelings trump that? So I want to continue to learn and grow. What I don't want to have is people nipping at my heels and, and saying, well, you know, I, I don't agree and I think we should have done this that one time. That's not a philosophy. That's you just pissing and moaning because you didn't get what you wanted. This is where I'm at. This is where I want to head. And this is how Brian Gutekunst will be judged. And again, it's less about results and more about process for me. If he's doing things the right way, results do matter, but they matter less. Because the people that are only results-driven, the only thing they seem to, to think is that if you're really good at your job, you don't make mistakes. And that's not the reality. Everybody's going to make mistakes. Now, over the course of several years, you can look at the results and see, you know, this person has been terrible at drafting. Clearly, there's something wrong with their process of evaluating talent, which is a separate process in and of itself. But I don't see that. No, he's not the number one drafting GM. Who gives a crap? Why? There's 32 GMs. Why does he have to be number one? And you think if you go get somebody that doesn't have a job right now, they're just going to skyrocket to the best GM in football? Maybe there's a reason they're not a GM right now. They're not even the 32nd best option. So that's where I'm at. We're, we're in a new era, and I want to see the young guys play. I want to see the contracts get a little bit more cleaned up. And then, I, I, and then from there, it's just results. It's just I want to see good coaching. I want to see good culture. I want to see hard work. And then it just, it's, it just again, it's just results. As long as they're following the right process, which the Packers seem to be as far as draft and develop, it really just comes down to how good is your team at evaluating and making the right decisions. I think we're, we're very close to, to getting back on track, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it, but there's still a lot of questions. And um, that's how everybody, in my estimation, will be judged. And so anybody that thinks that if Jordan Love is bad, you got some kind of a slam dunk, you're wrong, because I will still support the pick. Not because I'm a sycophant. I've explained it to you. It's the right process. It's the process that brought Aaron Rodgers here. It was the right pick, period. Anyways, um, I'm going to leave it at that. We got more training camp coming up. I'm very, very excited. Cannot wait. I am I am obsessed. In fact, I'm going to get on Twitter and start watching everybody else's training camp because I just I'm Jones in a little bit see how everybody's doing of course everybody's great and then I get jealous because they have videos and we don't you know Shamar uh, Shamar Jean Charles oh my goodness Jackson Smith and Jigba wrong three letter player JSN not SJC he's got he's got one highlight real catch and everybody's freaking out like Luke's Van Ness better be Reggie White um Bijan Robinson made just an unbelievable I mean he beat a guy I mean, it's one-on-one -on -one against a linebacker, and, you know, when there's 11 guys on the field, there's not nearly as much space. But still, juke the guy out of his shoes and then made just a ridiculous one-handed catch. So, starting to see a lot of that stuff, get developing a lot of envy, <laughs> but uh, just getting excited for the things to come. Anyways, you guys have a good rest of your day. I will talk to you tonight, tomorrow, whatever. Have a good one. Bye-bye.